the speaker Glenn Miller, who is an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Philosophy at uh, Texas and m University. His uh, background is in chemical engineering and uh, also has a master's and doctorate in philosophy, so such a technical <laughs> uh, experience. Um, and uh, also has been uh, active in the business world as a consultant and engineer. Um, Glenn is also an associate editor for the journal Science and Engineering Ethics, and together with uh, Ashley Chu, he co-edited uh, the volume Reimagining Philosophy and Technology, Reinventing uh, ICDE. So Glenn, uh, please um, feel welcome to, uh, to share with us uh, your views. Okay, thank you. Uh, here, right here. I'm getting pretty good at this, which means where it's time to go back in person. Uh, okay. Are you able to see my screen? Diana? It works. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Diana, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to join you on, uh, on this panel. I'm excited to be on the panel in part as uh, uh, you know, but uh, many of the other participants don't. Uh, I had the uh, chance to work with Satya uh, a couple years ago, and we traded 100 emails. This is before Zoom, and I never got to see his face. So I'm very excited to, to hear him and see him today on the talk. Uh, I'm also uh, excited to uh, work with Chen and to, to meet uh, the, uh, Alexandra, another panelist, someone else doing interesting work. So uh, I have a few more slides, I think, than uh, most other people do. So let me get started here. Uh, my, I'm going to do hopefully three things and maybe four if I have extra time uh, in this presentation. I think I have a, many more slides than uh, some of the other participants, so uh, I'll, I'll do my best to be timely with it. I'm going to say something about the university I'm at, Texas A&M. Uh, I'll say something about the course that we're teaching. I'll focus on a module, a one-week period that we spend focused solely on international engineering. Uh, and then if I have a little time, I'll say uh, I have a few other thoughts, uh, some ideas that uh, just kind of help contextualize what we're doing. Uh, I think it's important to know a little bit about where we're coming from, uh, what the universities we're teaching at. Uh, the United States is a diverse place, uh, and Texas is actually huge too. Uh, if it's about 880 miles from the east border of Texas to the west border. It's a full, full day driving. Uh, if you're doing that. Uh, and Texas A&M is the, the, I think we're the largest university in Texas. We are a large tier one research land grant university. That means that our mission is to uh, teach the people of Texas. That was the original mission. Now we've also picked up a, a heavy research load. Our main campus is in College Station, Texas. We have more than 67,000 students and almost 54,000 undergrads, lots and lots of people, 3,000 faculty, a student to faculty ratio of 19 to one, and a quarter of our students are first generation students. That means that neither of their parents attended university. Uh, it's actually one of the things that Texas A&M is pretty good at that I'm really, really proud of. The last year we had uh, our faculty earned or, or had $1.13 billion in research expenditures in the last fiscal year. Uh, we're the only university in the state of Texas to do that, so we're pretty proud of that. We're also a member of the Association of American Universities, uh, which is uh, 66 universities uh, that do uh, uh, the majority of the research that's done in the US and also play a pivotal role in setting the agenda for American universities. The biggest college at Texas A&M is the College of Engineering. It has 585 faculty. I am not one of them. I am a faculty in the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, we have just over 400, so our, we're the uh, second largest uh, group of faculty on campus. Uh, in the College of Engineering, there are just over 20,000 students, or almost 21,000 students. Of them, 17,000 are undergraduates. Uh, it should be 78, 22 uh, percent male to female ratio, kind of that standard number, and only 2.3 percent are international students. The graduate part of the college is uh, dominated by international students. It has about the same male female split, 75, 25, uh, but there's 2,233 international students. That means more than half of our students are international. Uh, the college has been growing too. Uh, we since basically 2012 the university or the college of engineering has been on a 25 by 25 uh, goal that is to have 25,000 students studying engineering by the year 2025 which is basically doubling in size uh, from the 2012 level 
Uh, and the biggest driver for that is to satisfy uh, the needs of employers in the region. Okay, that's a quick overview of, of Texas A&M. Let me say something about the uh, engineering ethics class that we teach. It's uh, actually pretty well known because it was early. It started in uh, about 1995 by two faculty, uh, a mechanical engineer named Mike Rabins and a philosopher named Ed Harris, CE Ed Harris. Uh, they started the class with 20 students in 1995 or 1996, and then it grew naturally to uh, about 150 students in 2003. Uh, before ABET changed their accreditation requirements. And at that point, the College of Engineering decided to make ethics mandatory uh, for all graduates of the college. At that point, enrollment doubled to 300. Uh, in the past year, about 2,000 students uh, took the class. And uh, this will be the last really, really big year for us. Uh, actually, this semester will be the last pretty huge semester. We have something like 956 grades that are due at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, so it's a, a big semester, a big class, uh, uh, a pretty complex one. We have 20 TAs who work with us. I have about half are from philosophy, the other half are from engineering. Uh, it's a writing intensive class. It satisfies some other university objectives. So we do quite a bit. We expect quite a bit out of our students. Uh, this is interesting. It's the last year that last semester that is required for all engineering majors uh, going forward. It will be an elective course that will still satisfy some other institutional requirements. Uh, so I anticipate uh, the the level of interest of the average student will increase. Uh, we're expecting about 450 students uh, next semester, down from about 900 this semester. So uh, the course objectives uh, have have kind of changed over time, uh, but I want to go through them quickly just because we've changed them in the past couple of years to meet a cultural diversity requirement that the university uh, has put in place. All students have to take a class that meets a cultural diversity requirement that helps students think about cultural issues, think about their own kinds of bias, uh, especially regarding race, gender, uh, national origin, those kinds of things. Uh, so the first course objective is to know and use some common methods for identifying, analyzing, and resolving ethical problems with an emphasis on clarifying conflicting positions and using dialogue to overcome this conflict. The second is to develop the capacity to think analytically, critically, and creatively about ethical issues in engineering and how engineering affects society and the environment. I'll come back to that theme uh, in a couple minutes. Third is to know and analyze some of the classic cases in engineering ethics and typical ethical and professional ethics uh, issues that arise in engineering work, especially those having to do with bias, power, and authority. The fourth is to explain ethical theories, moral principles, and technical details clearly and concisely. The fifth, know the NSB code, the code of one's own professional society and the major professional societies and organizations in engineering and be able to apply them to situations faced by engineers. And the sixth is to explain how ethical theories, principles, and values inform common engineering practices and applicable codes of ethics and laws with attention to how they differ by culture. So the, the changes that you see more reference to culture, bias, uh, discourse, those types of things than what we had previously uh, in the objectives for the course. And this does meet two of the ABET uh, A through, uh, one, one through seven student outcomes, number two uh, and number four. The course uh, is structured into three basic chunks. Uh, the first is on ethical theory or the foundations of ethics. We talk about the major Western uh, ethical theories, virtue ethics, duty ethics, utilitarian ethics, but we also try to work through some of the mid-level principles uh, that are common in applied ethics. Uh, things like benevolence, uh, uh, non-maleficence, uh, justice, those types of things. That's the first four weeks of the course. The next four weeks of the course is on microethics. You may recognize Joe Herbert's term here. Here we talk about professional societies and codes. Uh, we always talk about cases, but especially uh, in microethics, we spend extra time on that. We talk about licensing, risk, responsibility, the laws that govern engineering in the US, uh, and uh, ultimately in macroethics, we talk about the rest of the world as well. We talk about diversity and inclusion. We have a module that's set up on that. Uh, and I wanted to draw some attention to that because some of the, the same kinds of issues that you encounter when you work across uh, national boundaries or in, in the international space are the same kind that you run into when you work uh, within, uh, even within a, a 
culture that has, uh, or within an organization that has people from uh, diverse cultures. So we spend some time, we spend a whole week on that idea. Uh, and I think that helps us build some of the fundamental concepts that our students are able to use in the week on international engineering. We talk about standards of practice and whistleblowing. Okay, last uh, five weeks of the semester, basically after spring break, if we're in the spring, uh, we spend two weeks talking about uh, ethics and artifacts. Well, one week on ethics and artifacts and a second week on technology and society. Uh, I'll say more about that a little later if I have time. Then we have the module on international engineering, uh, which is also with environmental ethics and sustainability. Uh, and then we talk about intellectual property, data privacy and security. And we call that a semester. So we do a, a whole heck of a lot. Okay, so what do we do in the module on international engineering, which is uh, we've, we've added a subtitle to working in and between diverse cultures. Uh, the first is that we want to think about where we're coming from. And if I think about American engineering as a culture as a given, I'll say a little bit more about the idea of culture as a given on the next slide. Uh, we can think of ethics as shaped by, our ethics are shaped by a composite of almost completely Western cultural resources. The uh, one common idea is that engineering is morally neutral or maybe even stronger form of that, that it's always beneficial. Uh, our students tend to go through their undergraduate engineering education, thinking of engineering as technical science and natural science and, and the maths. Uh, so it's simply the task of solving problems, usually not as contextualized as what, what uh, actual engineering work is. Uh, and then of course, I think uh, at least in Texas, maybe especially in Texas, uh, but in the West in general, there's a primacy of the individual uh, uh, over any kind of social structure. Uh, and so I think that's where we're coming from uh, with our students and their ideas of ethics. Uh, in the US, and it's maybe, I don't know how this is in Europe, maybe someone could share this with me. There's a long history of corporate involvement in engineering education. That's why Texas A&M is going for 25 by 25 uh, at the undergraduate level. At the graduate level, there's a, a strong connection between military involvement and engineering. Many of you probably know uh, the first civil engineers were created because they were the ones doing engineering that was not military uh, engineering. If you look today, still a large amount of the uh, research that's funded in American engineering universities is funded by the Department of Defense and other defense related uh, organizations. So we wanna give our students some distance from that. And we have four learning objectives for the module, the week we spend on international engineering. Uh, the, the first is to, uh, it's actually a three part here, uh, broken up into A, B, and C. The first is to understand the distinction between culture as given and culture as constructed. Uh, culture as given is what we inherit uh, for our culture. Uh, I am a Texan. Uh, that means I believe certain things, although I was not born in Texas, and I don't necessarily believe the same things that uh, Texans do. Uh, the, uh, uh, but it's the general culture that we have, as maybe as an American uh, or uh, as a 21st century person. I can't really change the culture as a given to me. I, I like to describe this as something like the language that we inherit. We can make some minor tweaks, but our language is our language, and that's, that is what it is because it's shared so broadly and it's developed historically. Uh, and we want our students to draw a distinction between that and what's called culture as a construct or culture as constructed. That is the cultures that we develop in the groups that we work with. Uh, usually the smaller the group, the more we can shape our culture. The culture is a given. We, uh, we ask our students to look at uh, Shalom Schwartz's seven dimensions of culture to see how he, uh, how he or they position these different dimensions of culture and, and just think in broad terms about what we can say about Americans vis-a-vis uh, -vis Chinese or Russians or Indians. Third point in this first learning objective is to think a little bit about the different kinds of activities that engineers will perform in their work, uh, different kinds of activities that are, can be task-based or process activities, uh, and the different ways that people can work together. And depending on the task uh, or the, the kind of workforce or work team, you need different levels of cultural uh, intelligence. Okay, here is uh, Shalom Schwartz's Seven Dimensions of Culture. It's a lot like Gert, Gert Hochstedt's uh, 
I think five dimensions of culture. Uh, you guys are probably all familiar with this, so I won't spend any more time on that. And here is the, the just a quick picture of the book from David Thomas and Kerr Inkson on cultural intelligence surviving and thriving in the global village. Uh, I hate how the book is written. I think it's written for a 11th grader, maybe. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the ideas, I think, are pretty useful. Learning objective two is to ask our students to reflect on the cultural norms that they have experienced in the institutions and small groups that they've worked in, keeping in mind that they can change, and then trying to think a little bit about how the culture is a given, uh, or maybe cultures is a given. I'm part of many different cultures. Uh, interface with cultures is construct, develop that reflective sense. Hopefully they take that with, uh, with them after they graduate. Uh, third learning objective is what we started with, with international en engineering, and that's to understand the basic differences between bribery, extortion, and grease payments, uh, differences in, in corruption uh, transparency, uh, corruption perceptions, uh, understand what the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, a law that governs uh, what engineers or anyone who works for a company that does anything in the, engineer, in, in, in the United States can do as far as giving gifts to government officials. And then what the NS, NSP can, Code of Ethics says about bribes and extortion, which is basically that you, you generally can't pay them. Uh, the fourth learning objective uh, is to understand the theoretical and practical questions that arise from variances between cultures and individuals. Uh, engineers always wanna think about the practical question, but we think that this brings up a, a really interesting uh, philosophical question. And so we ask our students to think about the difference between uh, moral realism and cultural relativism. I put up a, a image from a slide that we show that uh, helps our students start to think in terms of meta ethics. That is whether the claims we make about the world are uh, in this diagram, whether the claims we make about the world are truth apt or not. Uh, and if there are moral facts or something like that, at what level do they work? We want our students to kind of feel the tension uh, between the challenge of of, of assuming or, or uh, believing that there are universal truths, but also all the, the, the challenges of doing so, the benefits and challenges of, of making that, that big meta-ethical claim. Uh, third aim here is to ask our students to think about cultural assumptions. And for this, we ask our students to read a, a paper published in Science and Engineering Ethics in the journal is called Social Robotics, Education and Religion in the Islamic World in Iranian Perspective. It's written by a number of Iranian authors. And I'm almost certain that none of the students walking into my class when they think about social robots ever think about uh, education and religion when they think about what the social robots can do. So it's, I think it's really neat to uh, bring in uh, uh, a paper from someone from a, a very different culture, especially from what Texas culture is like, to share their thoughts on technology and its development. Uh, last, uh, okay, the, the, I got that one again. Uh, never mind on that. And I see that I am basically, uh, I, I have one more slide to cover and then I'll, I'll turn it over and I'm basically right on my 20 minutes. Uh, I wanted to emphasize the importance that I think the two weeks of our semester have uh, for, for students in particular. Uh, I think we can do good work in this international engineering module because they have all the, all the fundamental tools. Uh, it, 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 as hard as it is to make some moral judgments when you're working within your own culture, if you can at least get a, a, a grip on how to do that reasonably well. When you move to the international, you, you have a fighting chance on it. Uh, so the, all, I think everything builds up in a way to this week on international engineering. But there's two, two modules that are especially useful, ethics and artifacts and technology and society. Uh, and there we, we get students to think uh, and develop a reasonably nuanced position on what technology does in the world. Uh, and I'm not sure that if we'd have the same success in the week on international engineering if we didn't spend time on that. One of the readings that we use that's really helpful is Robert J. Welkel's Is Technology Neutral? It should be a closed parenthesis there. Uh, and Welkel uh, was writing in IEEE, uh, Technology and Society. So it's an art article written by an engineer for an engineer that helps students think about how technology inframes the way they see the world. We also address some of these same themes that you run into with international engineering uh, in the cases that we discuss each week. Uh, we use Elizabeth Hausler's Build Change as an example. They built houses and help countries and uh, smaller uh, political entities write building codes. 
uh, to handle earthquakes and tsunamis. Uh, they do a lot of work all around the world, and uh, they're really attuned to what it means to do good work in different cultures. Uh, we talk about the Boeing 737 MAX uh, and uh, emphasize the uh, developed country bias, something like that, uh, when the first Boeing 737 crashed. The Boeing executives roughly said it wouldn't happen the US, in the U.S. Uh, it will only happen uh, in in countries where the they don't have the same safety standards. Uh, of course, that fell apart uh, when Ethiopia Air had their problem, and they're of course uh, phenomenal at safety. Uh, and then we learn, of course, that there's a big technical problem and all kinds of other issues going on in Boeing. Uh, and then we also talk about Flint and Washington D.C. with uh, lead in the water, uh, talking about how. Uh, uh, we need to be really concerned about the effects of the, the engineering that we do on our society, that they really matter. Uh, okay, I'm gonna skip the challenges and just thank you for your attention. And I think I was at 22 minutes. Uh, so uh, Diana, thank you for not cutting me off too quickly. Thank you for uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, extensive presentation with so many examples. I took many notes that would uh, be helpful for me, and I, uh, I'm sure that uh, both in the audience agree. And I want uh, to say that the last example about Flint, we were lucky to have uh, last month the speaker, Jana Lambridi, you know, uh, talking about her work uh, um, related to the Flint uh, water crisis. And now it is um, time uh, for questions. and. Uh, I already see a question uh, in the chat from uh, Chin Zhu. Um, others, uh, please feel welcome either to interact with our speaker via chat or raise uh, your hand to express interest. Chin, uh, should I give uh, the floor to you to ask your question? Uh, thank you very much, Diana. Uh, so, uh, you know, thanks very much, Glenn, for this very informative uh, presentation. Very interesting to me. When, when you were presenting um, a list of topics included in your course, I was very curious about, um, you know, uh, other colleagues here, to what extent these, these topics are more or less global or to what extent these uh, topics might be or may not be included in, uh, in courses elsewhere. So I'm just in general very curious about that. As far as uh, other, what, what my colleagues in engineering would do with this, or or how much my students have coming into the class? Is that the no, I, I what I'm what I what I was asking was basically um, to what extent you think um, maybe I change the question a little bit diff in a different way. Uh, these topics are representative concerns um, that uh, often you will find popular in uh, U.S. engineering ethics textbooks or courses. You as uh, as an instructor. So, so the, the course as a whole, I think, uh, probably fits the standard reasonably well. We use uh, this, this, we've used both uh, Ed Harris et al's and Martin Peterson's uh, textbooks on, uh, on engineering ethics. We read about two thirds of them. Uh, the week on international engineering, uh, I, think, I think we're doing some pretty novel stuff there. We spent a lot of time trying to develop some new materials there, and I would guess that it's probably not that widely taught. Uh, one challenge with engineering ethics is simply how to figure out how to have enough time to do what you need to, to build the fundamentals of the course, and then also to try to get into a topic like international engineering. You guys saw how much we went through in just one week, but we could, of course, spend far more time on that. But there's so much that needs to be done in our class, but also in the engineering, uh, uh, engineering program as a whole. Uh, but I don't really have a good sense. I, in a way, I wish I would have asked that question as a poll question, Chen, for everyone who's uh, on this uh, on this uh, on the Zoom to see how many people teach things like what we're doing in the international uh, engineering module that we have for our students. Chen, are you happy with the response? Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And we also have one question from Armando Sousa. Yeah, thanks, Armando. Uh, the way we typically grade our students on this week of the course, because of where it falls in the semester, which is basically toward the end of the class, is uh, by an exam. Uh, and that in the exam, they'll be asked uh, 
five questions, five multiple choice questions on ideas covered in this week. It is a little bit of a shame. We, we ask students to do a lot of work. <laughs> we ask them to, to, the biggest writing assignment they have is a research paper. That's 2000 word research paper. Uh, and they normally can't get into questions on international engineering because they haven't covered that material when they start writing the research paper. They basically write the research paper in stages over the last six weeks of the semester. Uh, so the evaluation is almost entirely over, uh, is, is by exam. We're testing what they know. The course is set up to have recitations on Fridays. So students will learn the, the main ideas in a yes, lecture of I. about 100 people. And then on Friday, they'll have a, a small group of 25 where they'll talk about the ideas that we've discussed. But we don't grade that. Uh, but we, we set up space and, and expect them to participate in the Friday recitations. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> I'm very, very curious, but are you able to grade the students in a, a 20 scale or a letter scale or how, how detailed is your grading? For, for, the you. course as a, for the course as a whole? Yes, for the course as a whole, yes. Uh, the, the, the grading that we do, the only grades that we give are A, B, C, D, F. Uh, so we're just putting into kind of big buckets there, uh, although we do it, of course, numerically because there's something like six or seven components to their course grade. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. Time for one more question, if anyone wants to raise their hand. Luis? Hey. Uh, Luis, yes. Thank you for your presentation, Diane. Uh, relative to the whole course, what is the relative weight of uh, this grading for the students? We, we spend about a week yeah. on this topic, one out of 14. So 7%, something like that, uh, of, the, of the exam grades will be based off of this topic. Uh, no, but uh, how, how, uh, sorry, how important is this grade, uh, is this rate uh, compared to the whole uh, rate of the graduation uh, as a global uh, graduation mark? It's uh, three semester credit hours and students are required to have, depending on the major, between 120 and 128 semester credit hours. So three out of 120. Uh, Two okay. percent, something like that. I don't know. I can't do the math quite fast enough. A little bit over two and a half percent, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I would, um, I would also uh, want to ask, what uh, do you think are the biggest challenges that students uh, encounter when um, being exposed to these uh, different, uh, different perspectives? And if it is uh, the first time in their education when there is such a high emphasis on uh, um, global uh, understanding of engineering practice. I think the, the, the fundamental challenge uh, is maybe one that we all have, uh, that is to figure out how to subject our beliefs, assumptions, and expectations that we have uh, to, to a, a critical examination and to figure out which ones we need to hold and which ones uh, don't matter so much or which ones we're willing to, to bend on. If I think something is right, do I think it's right just in my context or do I think it's right in the global context? This is a, you know, it's certainly a really interesting meta-ethical question that our students haven't thought about at all. Uh, when we first start, start talking about ethics, uh, there's always a risk that they collapse any claim about ethics to this vague idea and sometimes that works when you're working in your own culture. It doesn't work when everything is foreign, when you have to think about everything in you. You can't trust your own moral intuition. Uh, so I think that's the, the, the challenge there is just helping our students be able to articulate and think through what they believe, understand its limitations, and then be sensitive enough to what's going on in their surroundings so they can act uh, in, in a, a good or beautiful way. Thank you for for such a detailed uh, response and presentation. And uh, um, we are uh, giving the floor now to our uh, next uh, speaker, 
um, who is um, Alexandra Kasagova, and uh, she's a lecturer in the bachelor program of uh, sociology of technology and engineering and in the master program of social analysis of technological innovations and risks in the Bauman uh, Moscow State uh, Technical University. Uh, she's also teaching introduction to philosophy and philosophy of science and technology for the bachelor and uh, master engineering students in the Gupkin uh, Russian State uh, University of Oil and Gas. Alexandra, we are glad to have you with us. Thank you very much. May I ask if you see now the full screen? No, uh, no I think you should uh, go um, on the red ribbon, uh, the last icon, the fourth icon. Is it fine now? Okay, now? Um, and then okay. so we switch, switch off then the, the uh, full screen mode and turn just to, to the slides themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Are they readable at least? Yes? Yes, yes, we can, uh, we can see them. Okay. Um, I'm afraid it's too early to talk about uh, actual practices of teaching engineering ethics in um, Russia yet, because it is only emerging now. And uh, every step in its institutionalization is highly contingent. So I will describe the general context, trying to explain the constraints. Uh, for this institu institutionalization, and in particular with respect to what Tsin was asking about, um, applicability of the best practices of teaching uh, in the West in general, and especially in the USA. And then we'll illustrate with uh, only one case how the local agenda and um, challenges are shaping a research pro program and methodology of teaching in engineering ethics. Um, Firstly, the very general context, the historical um, situation localized. Um, engineering as profession in general is still recovering from the status crisis, which is associated with the discontinuities of the development policies. Uh, historical discontinuities of modernization between Russian Empire, USSR and contemporary Russia. Um, at the very early stages of professionalization, engineers did enjoy relatively high status. First, due to recruitment of the European personnel, and later due to formation of the highly elitist system of technical education. So the profession was legitimized by the state itself, uh, rather than struggling for social status or public recognition through self-organization in uh, professional societies, uh, as it is uh, characteristic for English-speaking countries. Uh, in its turn, the government of Russian Empire was not very much interested in self-organizations of uh, experts nationwide. Later, due to their high, so high social status at the time of births, the older generation of engineers was subject to repressions among the other educated groups, of course. Uh, and after the Second World War and during the Cold War and uh, due to the growth of mass production, uh, the call for massification of profession appeared. And by the late 60s or 70s, uh, engineers not only have regained their high, stat high social status, but also became the most popular figures of the mass, cultures, mass culture. And uh, the personification along with scientists and teachers, of course, uh, of the communist project. The subsequent stagnation, crisis, and the shock of neoliberalism hit engineers the most. And the profession fell victim to deindustrialization in the 90s, with either the downward social mobility or the brain drain. The long-term consequences, consequences, for example, of the exodus of women from engineering at that time is yet unexplored. And given that the engineering profession here is rather dynastic, I mean, uh, inherited within the families, the growth of gender gap will not be compensated soon. The contemporary generation of engineers uh, after this um, discontinuity and this generational gap 
is now only starting regaining its economic and political legitimacy against the background of uh, reindustrialization projects, but also against the background of militarization of economy during the last decade. Um, talking about the institutional context of the educational system, the technical universities are mostly state funded. And the majority of places or openings are budget funded. And the educational programs regulated with some exceptions for the top universities by the Ministry of Education through the top-down federal educational standards. The standards define both the expected outcomes, such as general and professional competencies, and until recently, the structure of curriculum. The expected outcomes or objectives are more or less echoing ABT criteria, as well as your AC system when it comes to social and uh, environmental responsibility and commitment to cultural diversity. So they largely overlap. What differs is the structure of curriculum. For example, the general education necessarily included philosophy and social sciences at the level of bachelor and a course in philosophy of science and technology for masters. Engineering ethics as a discipline of its own could rarely squeeze into this curriculum, more often as a module within the larger course. Uh, of course, placing engineering ethics as a module within courses of sociology or philosophy has its particular consequences. One may say that it's not about exercising moral choice and reasoning, but more about informing one's choice. What is discussed, for example, in the sociological syllabus is not engineering ethics, but the engineering ethics and its interactions and clashes with political economy of technologies or technocratic ideology. What is discussed within philosophy for engineers is the agency and its limitations in ethics of technology. On the other side, the moral imagination and intersubjectivity could be stimulated within these discursive practices, uh, at least due to the um, repeating shifts of perspectives and levels of generalization. However, the courses in social science and humanities, and even of philosophy, are now being replaced with elective courses with more employability-oriented soft skills. The question whether engineering ethics will be able to jump into this bandwagon and prove itself marketable depends on the inner coalitions within the universities. And of course, will also have further consequences for framing its content. Uh, the more uh, in some universities with a higher autonomy, um, engineering ethics was institutionalizing in the last 10 years, though very slowly, as both research and teaching discipline. The most often borrowings and references are naturally from uh, the Northern America traditions or both, profession of both professional codes of ethics and teaching methodologies. Another important source was the German discourse in philosophy of technology and technology assessment. However, there are obvious limitations for this uh, transfer of technology, so to say. Um, due to the limited um, potential of its uh, russification or localization. The ethical codes of the professional engineering societies in Russia were articulated quite recently. And to some extent, they look like, a, so to say, compressed version of the developments of the codes written in English, which were described, for example, by Karl Mitchum. But was it, what is even more important is that professional associations are not so much reference groups for the rank and file engineers. Membership in the professional societies is more symbolic status for the educational, scientific, or management elites of engineering, and neither a requirement nor a career advantage for majority of engineers. In short, uh, this short history of ethical codes and their distance from the practices of the masses of engineers make them a limited source for, of reference for engineering ethics. Another point is that the technical controversies uh, that are usually ready-made cases for engineering ethics textbooks in, for example, the United States, 
are not fully translatable and often not relevant at all for the industry in the post-socialist state. Uh, simply because of the attitude or status model of industrialization and different legal system. For example, the privacy policy of the commercial or business courts. The lawsuits and legal procedures from the history of American industry, which represent the many-sided conflicts of interest between the stakeholders are not fully applicable here. The activities of uh, ethical committees in the industry and in the government bodies are more visible and more likely to be sourced for case studies. However, this has led to the focus on the investigations of the techno catastrophes and um, rather than on the more mundane but no less important decision making process in the industry. The emphasis um, on the disaster studies, so to say, and on the notions of safety and risk is leading to a restrictive approach rather than motivating the proactive and positive motivation. I will now illustrate this um, adaptation project process with an activity of um, the team and the network of Research Institute of Applied Ethics in the Timani University of Oil and Gas. They are sometimes called Timani School. And uh, in the last decade, they received the strong institutional support, including the so-called rector's seminars with a wide discussion of the university's strategy and content of education. The activization of ethical discourse in this center, which has become an important node of a larger old Russian network, is of no surprise. Uh, this industry is not only gigantesque and pivotal for the economy, but also is the knot of theoretical problems, for example, due to the spatial distribution of uh, industrial infrastructure. Some of it uh, situated in the National Republics of Russian Federation or amidst the territories of the indigenous ethnic groups of the North. This creates issues at the intersection of sustainability studies, intercultural ethics of technologies, as well as energy ethics and engineering ethics. Uh, apart from them, the university itself was concerned with concentration of resources and high-tech research in the center in Moscow and St. Petersburg, which will lead to more practical but less innovative content of their own uh, educational programs. So the university's strategy uh, at some point, point came in conflict with its mission. And this um, con um, concern of the mission trickled down into the methodological discourse. What has been revived now is the notion of professional mission in engineering. It may sound strange uh, as a kind of modernist idealization or romanticization of profession, but on the other side, it's not necessarily technocratic. And it is distinct from both corporative mission and the scientific technological ideology of the state. Uh, this idea of mission is also being developed in response to the consideration that engineering practices are getting more collective and success non-personalized while responsibility remains personal. Uh, it's um, kind of motivating to regard social context not only as uh, restriction structures, but also as a field for creative discovery and assigning the meaning to engineering activity. It is easy to see that the concept of mission partly goes in line with aspirational or virtual ethics, but at the same time, it is compatible with alternative approaches. And uh, it is recycling some tropes of the Russian engineering cultures of the past. Uh, for example, the non-individualistic worldview, uh, which was trying to transcend the professional function and assign the existential function to engineering activities. So this is my example, um, which I regard as a um, kind of illustrative of what uh, university can do in creating a um, very local research program um, in response to the local agenda and larger all nationwide um, institutional context. Thank you. I would love to answer your question. 
So, Alexandra, for this uh, historical uh, setting of um, engineering ethics education in uh, Russia, uh, the floor is uh, open uh, to participants uh, for uh, questions, comments, uh, reactions. Alexandra, thank you for a very interesting talk. I have a, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about the content of professional mission. Uh, one of the ideas in the Western world uh, is that professionalism is often connected back to an idea of vocation, which has a religious connotation to it, uh, that, that you profess some kind of vows and this is who you're going to be as an individual. Uh, and the professional is uh, often connected to that, at least Ed Harris makes that connection pretty clear. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the idea, my sense of what you said in brief about professional mission is pretty different than that. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the content? What, the, what, is, what would be someone's professional mission or what is the professional mission of an engineer? And it's clear that it's not the governments and it's not the corporations. Okay, then what is it? Sorry, it is more or less echoing the considerations that were discussed in the 70s or 80s in the professional courts of the United States when uh, the safety, welfare and uh, health were entering the scene and afterwards the standard sustainability was trying to um, kind of balance this constellation of parameters. So this mission is about balancing the different um, light build in, 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 in German sense, uh, the, the different um, um, objectives that are contextually, very locally assigned their meaning. So this is, I'm afraid, uh, not a definite ultimate answer to this, but it's more a process of defining the mission rather than um, the, some particular definition. And then from a, a pedagogical perspective, do you try to guide students through that? Or are you trying to set out uh, pedagogical tools that can help people do that? Yes, I would, I would regard it as a kind of exercise. Yes, this is an exercise which with which you try to apply this tool to a different possible historical situation and as well as to different analytical methodological approach within ethics itself, because of course it does include the overview of ethical approaches, uh, as well as uh, the one you mentioned in uh, your presentation. Um, I would say that it is more um, an optics. Yes, kind of the and not, um, mission is an optics that you apply to different historical content and theoretic and uh, comparing the theoretical approach. Thank you. Thank you. Any reactions or comments also about this notion of professionalism, maybe also as a reflection in uh, other participants' uh, national settings? Uh, Chin? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. Um, this is super interesting, and I've seen a lot of, uh, actually, a lot of, lot of um, your discoveries, actually, I, I have already observed in um, the ways China, you know, adopted uh, many of these resources from the U.S. Um, so I was wondering, actually, if I remember correctly, one of the slides actually uh, is talking about how traditional philosophy uh, humanities courses are being replaced by softer skills uh, courses. Is that right? And also the other, on the same slide, you, you were mentioning the competence-based model. So I was wondering, whether this competence uh, or two things. One is where, where did this competence uh, oriented approach come from? Is that a base, an, again, uh, something that um, uh, imported from the US, uh, kind of a US influence? Secondly, is that do you think that these philosophy, social science, humanity courses are being replaced with these um, soft skill courses because of these competence oriented approach? Yes, I'm afraid the competence-based approach is um, in its very 
mm, in, in, in its very politics, so to say, is employability oriented. Um, to some extent, yes, it, it, it coincided with the Balinization pro process. So it's not, uh, it didn't happen yesterday. It, uh, it has been here for quite a while. But within the competency oriented approach, there have been shifts from this larger, so to say, unpractical general education that was inherited from the socialist system of education to more employability oriented approach. Um, and this also some kind of is aggravated by the growth inequality or gaps between the universities, which I described as uh, regional versus central technical universities. So I'm afraid, yes, this is also the dialectics of globalization. It is the local policy together with the um, international standards and um, Bolognian process. I, uh, I also had uh, a comment similar uh, to Chin and um, also a question because you mentioned uh, many um, elements um, imported from the American model of uh, engineering uh, education and uh, even a reference to the ABET criteria. And um, I was curious how, um, how um, are the ABET requirements welcomed in the Russian uh, system of engineering education and whether they are reinterpreted or contested in uh, any way? Yes, these uh, federal standards, which describe the general and the professional competencies, uh, they are mm, reformulating uh, both ABT criteria and the European standards. Uh, they are not directly referencing to it. Uh, I mean, well, it is uh, the imperative of uh, competitiveness, of course, to comply with the Washington Accord. Uh, but it's not directly uh, referred as um, following or implementing or copying uh, the ABT criteria. Yes, it is. It has very much in common. I mean, uh, the formulation of uh, uh, social and environmental awareness and responsibility within the limited resources and commitment to cultural diversity, etc. Thank you, Alexandra. And um, we have uh, time uh, for one uh, more question or comment. If, um, uh, uh, no one, uh, no one is uh, raising uh, uh, their hand. Um, I um, am uh, moving now to our uh, third uh, speaker. Um, Chin Zhu um, is with us. Um, Chin is an assistant professor of ethics and engineering education in the Department of uh, Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, and an affiliate faculty member in the Department of Engineering, Design and Society and um, the Robotics Graduate Program at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, Jin is also an editor for International Perspectives at the Online Ethics Center for Engineering and Science, um, an associate editor for Engineering Studies, uh, the chair of uh, American Society for Engineering Education's Division of Engineering Ethics, and uh, an executive committee member of the International Society for Ethics across the curriculum. Chin's um, research interests include the cultural foundations of engineering ethics education, global engineering education, and the ethics and policy of computing technologies and robotics. Chin, uh, feel welcome uh, to start your presentation. Thank you so much, Diana, for, uh, for your invitation, and thanks to um, all of you who attend, who are attending um, our session this morning. Um, so my talk today will be probably a little bit different from the, the last two presentations. So I wanted to have some kind of reflection on, so when people talk about global engineering ethics or engineering ethics in global context, what are some of the major uh, approaches? So what do we, what do people mean by global engineering ethics? So, um, so then I will, I will share with, uh, with you all a couple of questions I'm, I'm currently reflecting on. 
that um, you know these questions are related to global engineering ethics. All right. Okay. So first, I want to just give uh, people kind of like very brief introduction to sort of like motivation why global engineering ethics has become has become an issue. Um, Everybody knows that we have uh, a lot of these uh, multinational corporations at the, um, they, are, they are dominating the global economy. And then they have employees from, for, from different countries and they have businesses um, in many different countries. And then they are themselves are uh, globalized. And it could be also be possible that there are some of the national corporations, they, they want to expand their business by, ex, by by creating plants or branches in other countries. And also we need to think about global supply chain, right? Uh, one, one interesting example is this. Some of you probably have heard of this example, right? This is a typical example showing that how technology today is actually very global or globalized, right? This is kind of an example of a globalized artifact. You will see these airplane actually um, has supplies from uh, countries, uh, from many countries, right? Different parts of this airplane actually um, are manufactured by uh, com by companies uh, from from other from different places. So, um, and and I would even argue that uh, more emerging, like some of these emerging technologies, like um, artificial intelligence, robots, and these technologies are themselves uh, by nature global. Um, thinking about these algorithms, how they are being trained, right? They, they uh, you know, um, to train an algorithm, you need to get data from, uh, from, from humans. And then even if you design an algorithm in the US, then you have to, to, uh, to include, uh, you know, uh, people who provide data responses even uh, from some of the developing countries because of the, again, the global economy, such as um, in, in, in India, right? So, and then, more at a more micro level, you have these individual engineers. They, uh, you know, because of a global can, uh, uh, economy, they cross uh, national uh, cultural borders. And um, there's a term in the in English. It's called expatriate engineers, right? So these engineers are assigned to work um, away from their home countries. Uh, so it, it has become very common, even. If even now you will see actually a lot of engineers, they work in their own countries. They probably uh, are not expected to travel elsewhere. Um, however, because of uh, immigration movements and they, it's very likely, especially in the United States, um, for instance, it's very, very, very common for my students to work with uh, colleagues even uh, in, at a company in the US, working with someone actually from a, from a different country, right? So all these like patterns of global um, engineering practice um, basically have created uh, a question for engineering educators. So how do we educate engineers that are responsive um, to this increasing globalized environment? And more specifically, some of the pedagogies uh, in engineering education or specifically in engineering ethics education, would they still applicable to the, this increasing globalized environment, right? How do how we, our students from a particular country, particular environment, particular culture will work effectively professionally with um, colleagues from other cultures, right? So that's kind of like an issue. It's kind of like out there that uh, it's, it's challenging um, engineers from many different countries. Well, then, you know, uh, engineering, engineering educators and scholars have proposed uh, several different approaches to addressing this issue. So here I um, uh, conceptualize them into four different approaches. And you will see these different four, four approaches, they have different pros and cons, and they are, you, you will see sometimes one program may have one or even more of these different approaches to addressing engineering ethics issues in the global context. So um, you probably will guess what, what might be the, the first or the, the most popular one, uh, uh, arguably, approach to addressing engineering ethics in the global context. I mean, the easiest one, uh, a lot of engineers are proposing, we should do this. Uh, we should actually create, a, create some global codes of ethics because if, imagine you, um, especially again, I, I have to 
share with you this, that um, all these like resources approaches, um, I have to say that often are very uh, dominant in the American context. So I'm, I'm basically sharing with you most of, most of the information is actually from my experience teaching the US, right? So the first approach, a lot of American engineers, they suggest that we should create global codes of ethics. In other words, when engineers working, American engineers working in a different country, then they still have to com comply with certain codes of ethics. In other words, these codes of ethics um, have global applicability. Or when they are interacting with engineers from other cultures, right? So what are some, what might be some of the guidelines for them to work with engineers from, from a different culture? So some of the professional societies, in fact, in, uh, such as IEEE, uh, American Society of, of uh, Mechanical Engineers and National Society of Professional Engineers, they have clearly, um, they have clearly uh, indicate that their code of ethics <clears throat> excuse me, their codes of ethics actually, in fact, um, their members, no matter where they are, they should always uh, comply with these codes of ethics. So these codes of ethics, in fact, themselves are global because they require their members to apply them no matter where they are in the world. But also they have these professional societies often have, especially IEEE, often have members from other countries, right? So these codes of ethics themselves are globalized. And, but, but still there are, um, other colleagues are trying to build more of like globalized um, code of ethics. So here's one example by, um, I think, two scholars from uh, Canada. So they actually compared um, um, IEEE code of ethics with code of ethics for, uh, of uh, comparable professional societies in uh, different countries. And they, they, they've looked at it, uh, these different, different articles actually um, in these different different codes of ethics, um, they found that in fact um, many many of these codes of ethics from different different countries uh, share a lot of similarities. So they argue that it is technically possible to create a uh, universal code of ethics that engineers from all of these different countries can uh, practice when they work together when they work across cultures, right? And you will see there are, there are some of these different, uh, maybe differences, right? But, 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 but in general, you see a lot of similarities. And their argument is that if we can address some of these socio-political differences, which they think it's possible, uh, then you are able to build at least some minimum level of uh, universally accepted code of ethics so that uh, electrical engineers should be able to um, again, to adopt um, world widely. So this is a first approach um, to build global code of ethics so that it's, it's much easier for, for people to, to practice, to remember, to even to integrate into uh, professional education. But one of the criticisms might be, right? Thinking about how difficult actually different countries are able to you know, uh, they achieve consensus on a lot of uh, global issues such as, as uh, climate change, right? If climate change is, is so, it has already been there um, for such a long time and also it's, it's a more pressing issue than, uh, to me, I think, arguably, than uh, uh, engineering ethics issue. Um, uh, so if there's, you know, consensus on that, it's so difficult to uh, achieve, how, why do we believe that you know, an effective global code of ethics is possible. Um, so that's the first approach. Now, the second approach is basically a criticism of the first approach. The second approach is, is adopted by mainly uh, two American philosophers and uh, especially Michael Davis, uh, many of you probably are, uh, are familiar with. So his basic argument is that, forget about all these like, you know, uh, cultural differences or national differences. Engineering as a profession itself is a culture. The culture itself is, is, is more powerful than national cultures. In other ways, engineering as a culture, when engineers working from different cultures, they, they collaborate. The reason why they can collaborate is because they share a kind of similar culture or language, which is called engineering. In other words, those people who are like 
trying to build global code of ethics itself is just reinventing the wheel because engineering itself is globalized. So uh, here's one quote from uh, basic from his book. Um, I'm going to read here. Engineers, no matter where they are from, are identified by a common curriculum imparting a common discipline, a culture that is a shared way of doing certain things, the distinct way of doing things we call engineering. In other words, if we have an engineer uh, from, from China, another engineer from the US, now they should be able to, uh, to collaborate once they are uh, in the uh, at the same location. And they're, 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 the first identity is an engineer, and the second identity, secondary identity is, uh, you know, an, uh, a national from a particular cultural context. So again, engineering as a culture is more dominant, more powerful, more globalized than national culture. So you don't have to worry about it because engineering is a kind of like um, uh, national, uh, no, no, global, global culture. Um, and, and, and Michael Davis and his team actually, uh, they have done empirical studies looking, you know, they, they, they surveyed engineers, particularly in China, asking about some of the questions that American engineers often find familiar with, such as, um, uh, do engineers believe that they have to hold paramount safety, welfare, and, uh, uh, um, and health, right? This is a first a canon of the uh, National Society for Professional Engineer, Engineers Code of Ethics. Um, they have found that um, uh, most of Chinese engineers do think that, did think that it's an important aspect of their identity. However, I would say there are uh, quite a few methodological problems, right? Uh, you, you asking an engineer uh, if uh, they think that public welfare is, is helpful, is, is, is important, is different from how they actually would actually situate it in their everyday practice and how that such a concern is embedded in the uh, professional curriculum, right? So, but still uh, another uh, criticism, uh, at least from, from, from me, myself is that, imagine two engineers, one is from China, one is from the US. Is that the, the thing that uh, on the first day, they will have no problem at all collaborating with each other, understanding each other, or they will need some time, at least some days to, achieve, to understand each other, to achieve some kind of consensus in order to work effectively, right? So that's kind of like more in, kind of like empirical test. I, um, I think it's important for the function and this, the theory to, to think about. Um, here's another um, uh, uh, example who, uh, another scholar who actually supported this approach is uh, uh, Heinz uh, Lugenbeil. Um, he's, he's, his kind of view is very similar to, uh, at least from my perspective, to Michael Davis' view, is that um, it's, it's possible to build some of like a common values or like universal values, universal um, uh, code of contact uh, based on kind of like careful examination of engineering. So he and his team came up with a list of these um, six different principles that um, they thought these are fundamental principles of engineering ethics independent of any particular cultural context because the assumption is easy, right? Because no matter where you are, you're all, you know, engineers are doing engineering, right? So such as a principle of public safety, the principle of human rights, the principle of environmental animal uh, preservation, engineering competence, scientifically founded judgment, openness, and honesty, right? So these are the principles uh, are internal to the engineering profession, no matter where you are, no matter what kind of, where you, you practice engineering. Um, again, we, uh, um, it, it, they, they, again, I think one question is they, they haven't explained very well why these six uh, values or six principles instead of others, right? Um, and 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 they have not they have they have they have also to just, uh, further explain why whether uh, words such as public safety or human rights may be understood differently in different cultures, right? Or priori prioritized differently over other things differently. Um, the third approach is often adopted by um, a lot of cultural anthropologists and um, uh, scholars in business ethics. So they are uh, more interested in how practice of engineering um, on, the, on the factory floor um, is actually different uh, in different countries. So anthropologists will do a lot of observations looking at exactly the, like the, the ways how problems are defined and solved um, 
in, in different countries. And um, here's one example I'm sharing with you is that um, um, business ethics colleagues um, looking at how the three cultures, Europe, US, Asia, um, again, in, in the corporate context uh, on the factory floor, how they define uh, ethical conduct differently and who would be responsible, right? And any guidelines for ethical behavior in these uh, in three different cultures. So the argument is engineering students have to understand these differences in order to work competently in like in a very specific context in these different cultures, right? So the assumption is that engineering is actually a localized, instead of a global practice, engineering is actually very concrete local practice, right? And, and how engineers were trained um, is actually related to the broader historical cultural context of the country or of the culture, of, of, the, of the environment they, uh, they work in. So this is a kind of a third approach I'm sharing with you. Um, and then colleagues have also developed tools to assess this kind of like cross-cultural competence. This kind of approach to me, I think has a potential uh, challenge, which is that this approach is, is reducing global engineering as ethics or global engineering education to simply cross-cultural competence, right? And a lot of, lot of, um, uh, lot of studies in, in, uh, in this approach often will apply uh, instruments from cross-cultural competence or cross-cultural psychology and apply them into, into engineering education or engineering practice. And then still remains a question of why why we should why we should do this right, and then um, and it's it's this kind of a practice is a little bit different from their own assumption that you know the differences actually are coming from you know how engineering practice is done rather than the social cultural part because you have also to explain whether uh, to what extent or whether you know the the engineering practice has or has has no effect on um, how we understand just, uh, you know, human moral psychology or human cultural psychology, right? Does engineering uh, practice make any difference when, when we when look at um, um, how humans behave in different cultures? That's another question for, for colleagues in this, uh, in this camp. The last but not least approach is global ethics and justice. So this is a fourth approach. It's it's getting more and more popular in the US. Uh, instead of looking at national differences between different countries, how engineers do their things uh, differently, um, uh, a group of scholars looking at um, you know, fundamental values, like almost human rights or global ethical values that they think are important for ach to, to achieve global justice, right? Uh, like Martha Newsbaum's uh, human capabilities approach, right? How to incorporate these kind of like concerns fundamental human rights, no matter where you are, you are supposed to have a list of these like, you know, fundamental human rights, human capabilities, how to incorporate these human capabilities into engineering design, how to uh, use engineering expertise to help um, um, underserved communities, especially from developing countries, underserved um, communities to develop these uh, human capabilities is another uh, approach. So I'm gonna give uh, a quick summary of the four different approaches uh, I just summarized. The first is global code of ethics. So the, the concern for this approach is to promote a globalized engineering profession with creating these uh, global codes of ethics. The functionalist the theories basically says we don't, we don't have to do anything or we, have to, we only have to do things on the basis of our understanding of engineering itself because engineering itself is a global culture. We don't have to worry about you know, cultural differences. Well, the third approach, cultural diff diff studies, basically argues that engineering is a localized practice, but it's, it's being challenged by globalization. So we have to start from a kind of anthropological understanding of engineering as a cultural practice in a localized, in, in a local area. Now, the last one is global ethics and justice. The goal is to promote a set of universal ethical values shared by all cultures, uh, no matter where you are, who you are. And again, the focus is mainly on you know, the, the welfare of uh, people in underserved communities. Um, 
maybe in the next couple of minutes, I, I want to sh share with you my last slide is uh, some kind of like questions I've been reflecting uh, related to this topic, global engineering ethics. Um, but before I, I, I start to share these questions, I want to ask um, everybody a question. Since there are four different approaches to global engineering ethics, for, for students, for engineering educators, this is a problem, right? Uh, because there's a no consensus on how global engineering ethics should be taught. So now we have the four different approaches. Should any program is interested in, in introducing global, the global into their uh, their curriculum, into their ethics curriculum, um, include all of them or some of them or uh, just uh, uh, maybe one of them, right? So this is an issue. Especially uh, it's possible that, uh, you know, these different approaches sometimes can have uh, different views on the global. Uh, secondly, to me, I think all the four different approaches often um, place a strong emphasis on um, engineering, like uh, Alexander was mentioning earlier, on competence. Um, in other words, really focus on the individual, uh, the, like in the individual level of engineering practice, how we, how we are going to educate uh, individual engineers, right? But <clears throat> Is that all what we want to do? And then also the assumption here is that engineers in the future, or or most of these or most of these uh, code, um, approaches, would be mainly applicable to engineers who or engineering students are interested in working cross uh, uh, cross culturally, right? And and then it is only a kind of like a part of engineering education curriculum that you know, as you may know, any engineering education programs. Especially in 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 like in North America, in sometimes in Europe as well. I'm guessing, is that there are many different kinds of non-technical soft skills, right? Soft skills. I hate this term, but that's how people often call today. Um, I mean, global is just one of them. It's it's probably not even as important as other soft skills such as ethics, such as ethics, communication, entrepreneurship. So my question then is. Do people think that uh, global should take a more important or more visible role in uh, engineering education programs? In other words, we sh should we move global from the kind of like a marginalized place, uh, not even as important as ethics or communication to the center of, of the curriculum? I mean, if you want to do that, how to do that, right? So then I'm going to share with you a couple of questions. The first one is um, related to the question I, I just asked. Will, will global engineering ethics be helpful for those who are not expected to work in cross-cultural contexts? How do we justify the value of the global for, uh, uh, to, to these students, right? Those say, well, I will, I will never work in cross-cultural contexts. I'm gonna work in the small town in Wisconsin. I will never, uh, we have very few people from other countries. I will never see people uh, from other countries, um, why should I learn about the global? Um, the second question is how is uh, global or engineering ethics in general relevant to current increasingly intense global political environment in which competition trumps, trumps over collaboration, right? It seems to me the global today has a different meaning. It's, it's kind of like environment, but countries are not collaborating with each other very much often, right? compared to maybe um, 10 or, or, or eight years ago, right? And, and if that's the case, and, and here I'm sharing with you this, um, with the rise of China, right? Um, you know, uh, United States and European countries have already seen China as a potential threat to democracy, right? Against that background, how will global engineering ethics then look like? It's, it's really difficult probably to imagine that um, a future world that has this kind of like, a, you know, uh, ideology, right? China as a, as, as a threat, uh, you know, rising, rising power is going to really challenge the democratic world. However, we ha you know, the, the, the democratic world has still to have to, uh, has to collaborate with China, but also compete with China. This is re extremely critical, but also complicated global political environment. How do we teach that to students? The third uh, question here is that how to teach seemingly 
local engineering problems in a global, globally relevant ways. Uh, kind of like engineering problem itself seems to be seems to be um, a, a local practice. Uh, talking about how to probably uh, uh, build a bridge, right, or how to uh, how to design an algorithm, right. But still, global supply chain or other, um, you know, um, uh, or or uh, you know other other possibilities. But you know, they will involve people, resources, materials, even data from other 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 places in the uh, in the world, right? So how to how to teach that in a globally relevant way, um, or in other ways, how to <clears throat> bring the global to the fore or the center of defining and solving many of the problems we're facing today, like uh, uh, how to design a, a truly equitable, um, let's say, uh, you know, uh, algorithms, right? We need data from from India, but uh, the algorithms, uh, people in the developed world. Uh, you know, uh, uh, create created will not directly benefit an Indian people, right? And also, thinking about these algorithms um, have a lot of issues when they were designed, right? How to justify that? We 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 in order to improve the the accuracy efficiency of the data, or even like eth um, ethical justification of these algorithm. And we first uh, to to test these algorithms among Indian. Indian people, right? How to justify that? Despite that, these algorithms will not directly benefit, at least uh, in the first place, Indian people. And then, um, and and how to further justify, for instance, um, and, and Indian again, Indian people have to have to have to rely on these jobs, and sometimes have to rely on these jobs in order to 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 live in a life, while these uh, these practices will not directly benefit their own country um, and their, their own ways of living. So I, I found these kind of like questions probably um, very challenging. So I'm gonna stop here and see if um, people have any, any questions. We have probably around six minutes. Thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, presentation and uh, I give the floor now to our audience. Uh, um, and, um, Please share with us your insights, your reflections, uh, uh, some ways in which you make sense of these reflective questions in your activity as a, as a teacher. Oh, sorry, uh, then could you, Diana, could you repeat the last part of the question again? I, my internet didn't. Um, uh, for the, I invited the participants to okay. Um, uh, okay. provide yeah. answers uh, to these reflective mm -hmm. questions uh, situated in their own activity as teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Luis? Thank you very, uh, very much for your uh, uh, insightful and uh, uh, open-minded presentation. <laughs> uh, if I can, if I can uh, just uh, add uh, a small note about what I generally do uh, to distinguish between morality and uh, ethics uh, when I'm talking with my students, I generally tend to say that, uh, to think uh, that uh, morality is um, context dependent, uh, namely uh, culturally, uh, politically, and uh, religiously, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, context dependent, while uh, ethics is kind of a, a reflection on moral principles that uh, uh, should be um, respected and followed uh, in order to achieve those global values that you are talking about. So uh, this tends, for me, uh, I tend to present ethical, ethics, ethics as something which uh, aims to be rational and globalized, less contextual, contextualized than uh, morality. Uh, in this, uh, so, so uh, taking this as, as a base, uh, I, I I'd like to ask your opinion about uh, if, uh, if we don't have necessarily the freedom of expression, how can we share those global values uh, you were 
perfectly uh, right talking about. Uh, I, and I think that uh, in some circumstances, uh, freedom of expression is not ensured uh, uh, at a sufficient level for those global values to be uh, respected and uh, the aims to be achieved. Was I clear? I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, uh, I'm trying. Uh, this is a really good question. I, I think, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, to see how I can respond to this question. I think uh, expression, um, freedom of expression is really important. Um, but again, I, 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 I often tend to say any, you know, ethical concepts or uh, you, you might want to call moral concepts have to be understood uh, in, uh, you know, in context, right? Um, expression of freedom doesn't, okay, so my experience with, at least with, uh, with the um, American environment is that expression of freedom sometimes is too complicated. Um, it's more than just- Freedom of expression. <laughs> a, fr a freedom of expression is so complicated. Sometimes it's more than just, uh, you know, uh, I can say whatever I want. I want. So freedom of expression and global values, they, 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 they are interrelated. In order to have this freedom of expression, you need certain values to, to support, such as respect others, right? You have to, um, to, to follow certain like, like uh, uh, rules. And then on the other hand, in order, like you said, to have, to really uphold these global values, then you need expression of uh, freedom of expression. I'm sorry. So it's, in, in the US, the, the, the conservatives sometimes will use, will, will, will use the, 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 the kind of like uh, freedom of expression as a, as a rhetoric to basically, really highlight what they want, the, the political agenda, their own political agenda, while overlooking the rights of other people. So I, 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 th I think, and also expression of freedom to me, of oh, freedom of expression, I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep making this mistake. It's, it's I agree, it's, it's important. Uh, but I just realized it has to be discussed in very specific contexts, and then it's it's more of, to me. I think it's more of like a, a political theory than than actual practice, at least in a democratic country. And we have to do way to do way too much work to actually make translate from a political ideal to uh, to a practice. Uh, please, please, if I can specify a little bit more, just uh, in two words, I give you an example. Okay. Uh, imagine that we are cooperating, uh, uh, US and China, two engineers are cooperating mm -hmm. in a project, a common project. But at a certain moment, the problem of security is raised. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, both think that uh, uh, security is not being sufficiently ensured. Right or uh, the human rights, but security, for instance. And right. uh, both engineers have their technical opinion about how to uh, uh, really achieve security, uh, uh, safe, safety uh, granted, and so on. Uh, um, so they have a technical solution. But the technical solution may be uh, against a certain number of political values. And uh, uh, there is a certain point where the engineer feels that uh, he should say anything, he shouldn't say anything more because uh, his job may be at risk. <laughs> because uh, yeah, the, uh, the freedom of expression is not 100% ensured in this case. It's, well, let me put this way, Luis. I think at this in current political environment, it's really difficult for me to imagine such a project it would even exist. <laughs> uh, you know, China and uh, Western country yeah. or uh, American country or American or so there's uh, a way to go uh, until global do something on on on, on global on, on global cybersecurity. That seems to me itself it's it's an issue yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. because I think at the, you know at the very beginning I think the you know uh, uh, for uh, good or bad but you know China and the uh, and uh, you know Europe and U.S. now have more ideological differences than actual cultural differences. Um, I would encourage, 
I, I would hope that you know people from all the three different cultures can actually sit down, be more prog programmatic, and listening to each other, and to understand what these concerns actually are, whether we can find common interests and uh, you know um, in human rights. In um, but I think that you know the stance itself is really important. You if if you think the other person is an enemy, then you know you you can you can never uh, achieve any consensus, right? Thank you very much. Glenn is raising his hand. We have uh, one final question from Glenn. And thanks for a really thought provoking talk. Uh, I have two questions. One, we'll talk about offline. I want to know what you think I'm doing in my class based on the four main ways to do it. What am I doing? But the second, the second comment, and it's just a comment, is to say, I think that if you say, how do we teach people to answer these questions that you pose, you'll fail. If you say we need to help people ask the right questions and give them some of the tools to answer them, then you can come up with a pedagogical strategy that makes sense. Right. You need I, them to be philosophers. Right, right. I, thank you so much, Glenn. I, I really like this really insightful comment. I, I think that's a good distinction you've made. Uh, Andrea, quick question uh, before we move to our last speaker. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to I'll be really quick. Thanks, Chin, for this talk. Um, I was trying to formulate this question a little bit, I don't know, more productively or something, and I don't think I've managed, but I'll ask kind of a, the crude version of this question, which is, to, which is something like, um, I like this typology that you've sketched here but i think and my my impression is that the last uh entry or the last category is mm -hmm. it doesn't fit to me as clearly as these other the first three yeah. do mm -hmm. and i think i have some ideas about why i don't think it fits so cleanly first of all it's not really like if we think about the capabilities approach it's not really mm, I, of course there are engineering applications mm -hmm. but it's not really engineering focused in the same way that the right. other kinds right, of- Right, right, right. What I'm, what, what I'm saying that uh, I'm talking about the application of human capabilities in engineering work, um, and maybe a different term for it, it's uh, international development in engineering or you know uh, peace engineering, something like that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all of your comments and questions and um, really appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are now uh, turning to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Satya Sundar Sethi, who is an associate professor of philosophy at the Department of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. He's also the recipient of the prestigious Young Philosopher Award in 2017, conferred by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, the Ministry of Education and the Government of India, and uh, published several papers in the journals and contributed chapters to the edited books, including a chapter with uh, our first speaker Glenn Miller and um, among his uh, publications are meaning and language, uh, contemporary ethical issues in engineering, higher education and professional ethics, roles and responsibilities of teachers and introduction to logic and logical discourse. Uh, Satya, please. Hey. Hello. Uh, it is, so shall I start? Okay, uh, so Thanks for the invitation, uh, Diana. So my hello and hi to all the colleagues from different parts of the group. So today I'm going to share uh, my experience about teaching uh, hearing ethics at my institution. So um, I belong to India and I work in IET Madras that stands for Indian Institute of Technology Madras. This is uh, one of the premier institution uh, in India. and. Uh, just a little background, I'll tell about this engineering ethics course and how it is a successful course in IIT Madras. Uh, so in India, you'll find that most of the premier engineering institutions, those are internationally recognized, such as IIT and few other engineering institutions. We offer the engineering ethics course as a compulsory course to all this BTEC and dual degree students, engineering students. And of course, in some of these engineering colleges, you'll find this course is offered in different titles. They give different names to that, but the aim is to help the students to understand 
and introspect their ethical, social, and professional responsibilities for the society at large. That is the basic aim. Now, in India, like in other country, we have a AICT. It stands for All India Council for Technical Education. That is an accrediting government uh, governing bodies. This accrediting bodies does all kind of accreditation in almost all the engineering colleges with certain programs. Now, it doesn't state that engineering ethics course must be taught in the engineering curriculum for the BTEC and dual degree students. So therefore, uh, what we find in India is that in some of the engineering institutions, this engineering ethics course is offered as an elective course. In some other cases, it is offered as a pass-fail course. And in few engineering institutions, this course is not offered to the students. So students do not get chance to study that. Now, uh, the question is that, why we offer this course in IIT? Since I work in uh, IIT, one of the premier IIT, I'll say that we offer it for various purposes because it is an international recognized institution. And we know that there's a significance and merits of this course. So how do students come to IIT Madras for their engineering program? In India, every year we conduct two stages of examinations, J main and J advance. J stands for the joint entrance examination. So this is, uh, this is uh, the examination is taken care by the Ministry of Education, centrally located. Now, those who will uh, clear this examinations, then they will appear in the J advanced examination. And any student who, who pass in the J advance or clears the J advance can take admission in IIT. So therefore, in IIT, you will find mostly Students are different parts of India. So it's like heterogeneity culture. We have a different language, different culture, different religion, background, so on and so forth. So in every IIT, you find that students are coming from different background. And in addition to that, there are a few students. They are coming also from neighboring countries. Of course, they need to appear this J main exam and J advanced examinations. Now, what is the criteria for appearing in J for them? So anyone, any student who has 12 standard uh, marks it, having 65% mark, they can appear in the exam. But here there is a terms and condition. All the candidates, they can appear in this examination in three times only, not more than that. Some of the student could not clear it in three times. So these students would not be able to get into IAT admission. So therefore in IAT culture as such, you'll find there's a heterogeneity of students and students from other neighboring countries as well. And of course, we have some exchange program in engineering uh, courses. Now, since I deal with this course, so I'm sharing my experience, how I'm doing it, or how we do it from IIT Madras. So this course is offered to the students in every semester. So therefore, there are two semester in a year, we offer it. So anyone who has entered into their third semester or fourth semester, I would say that from their second year towards the last, in other words, I would say those are in their third year and the fourth year. Third year means either I would say fifth and sixth semester or seventh or eighth semester in their program, they enroll in this course. So therefore near about 450 students we find in every semester. So it's a mostly a large class that we deal with. So therefore here I would say it is a compulsory course. And we also consider that it is a part of our engineering curriculum. That means any student will get this engineering degree must have passed this engineering ethics course. Now, what is the objective of this course? For us, we have formulated in the following way. The course is, the course is to assist students for the development of their professional behavior and ethical decision-making abilities in the engineering profession. So that is the main objective or the prime objective to offer this course. So therefore, this course is designed, keeping in mind all the students coming from different, different parts of India and also different departments like mechanical, civil, chemical, uh, electrical, then computer science, applied mechanics, so and so forth, even ocean engineering and aerospace engineering. So therefore, basically heterogeneity of students will be able to see in that class. Now, what is the curriculum that we do? 
the curriculum we have designed in such a manner that that it should help the students to think critically about their works beyond the engineering disciplinary knowledge and get ready to accept professionally in their future career. If any sorts of ethical problem or dilemma comes, probably they would have able to handle it. So therefore, in the engineering ethics curriculum, we include some of the ethical theories, like one of our uh, presenters said that, so we can say virtue ethics, deontic ethics, et cetera, et cetera, some of the ethical theories, then some of the national and international questions, and not necessarily only the engineering disasters. Otherwise, students will feel that engineers are only doing the disasters. Certainly not. So rather, we are encouraging them to see some of the good habits that other engineers are practicing across the globe. And of course, we have content like contemporary socio-political economic problems that are encountered by engineers in their workplace. So these are the mostly content that you find in our course. Now, therefore, two categories of ethical concepts that faculty member that deal with in the class. One is microethics, another is macroethics. Faculty members, those who deal with microethics, mostly they discuss on individual engineers, managers, employers, and their approaches to take the ethical decisions in various situations that they come across. So therefore, students get some kind of practical knowledge by listening to the lectures or by viewing the video clips shown by the uh, course instructor. Now, with regard to macroethics, the discussion is focused on social responsibility, the issues pertaining to social responsibility, social artifacts, how engineers should design the artifacts, what are the, what are the criteria they need to take into account while designing the artifacts, human technology mostly, so all these issues are discussed with regard to macroethics. And these are the literatures where the authors, they have said that these are the good practices. One should adapt it while delivering uh, an engineering ethics content to the students. So therefore, after learning this, microethics and macroethics, we find that students, they're able to get an opportunity to see a tree, on the one hand, and the same time understand the forest. What it means, they can see the local engineering culture, traditions, and approaches. And the same time, they can able to see the global perspectives and in inverse relation also. So more or less, they know that what is happening in and around the globe and how engineers are behaving towards a particular situation and so and so forth. So to do that, we adopt the team teaching model, the team teaching model. What it means? some of the philosophy faculty and engineering faculty from various disciplines, let's say mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. So we come together and we deliver the lectures. It's not one day everybody will come. It is basically, I'll tell you how we do it in our institutions. But nevertheless, I can tell right now that philosophy faculty and some of the engineering faculty they involve to teach this course to the students. So with regard to the instructional design and delivery strategy, as I told you, the teaching, team teaching model that suits for the large class. And students, they get benefit directly because they could able to see the perspective from a philosopher, the perspective from an engineer, and perspective from an uh, entrepreneur who is working in engineering somewhere. Their direct hands-on experience, they can able to get it also. So therefore, in every Tuesday, in a week, every Tuesday afternoon, we engage the class two and a half hours given. It's a big lecture hall. So where students feel comfortable and two and a half hours class, we get it. So it's a good time for us to deal with the students, to share the, our ideas, arguments and listen from them also. So therefore in each class, you'll find there's a lectures given by uh, the, the professors, then screening of certain relevant video clips, maybe three minutes, four minutes, depending on the context. Now, again, discuss certain case studies followed by students group presentation come interaction. This is more important. After listening to the case studies, we make them certain groups that are representatives from the, from the student body. They make them group and they themselves come out to present their ideas, views on the case studies. And then after that, interaction follows. So in this process, you'll find that the students learn from the peers and at the same time, 
they get some sort of new knowledge, new information from the course teachers. So in that way, in the afternoon after having lunch, we can make them happy instead of allowing them to sleep in the class. So imagine 450 students after lunch, they have to sit in a class and we have to put our best effort to make them alert. That's another challenge that we have in India, that too in my institutions. Now, therefore, we adopt the methods such as lectures, screening the video clips, group discussions, stage presentations, critical examination of case studies, and resolving some of the ethical dilemmas faced by engineers by applying the code of ethics. Now, with regard to the code of ethics, we also have Engineering Council of India. Of course, we have borrowed certain kind of uh, statements from NSP, but in overall, we tell them that these are the code of ethics available for engineers. So globally, as well as locally, so that whenever the first difficult to resolve an ethical problem pertaining to engineering tasks, they can take some of this code of ethics from, from, from different council and can able to resolve it. And where they can get the feedback from their peers as well as course teachers. So mostly what we do, we have adopted the Pedro's and Silverman's proposals. And this is also uh, endorsed by many authors like Ockers in 2013 and Spider and a few others. So what is, what is that modern? It is a five types of teaching and learning style that we clocked and adopted in the engineering ethics course. So everybody has a freedom to choose whatever they want to do it. But at the end, the aim and objective of the course need to be achieved. So the first is that concrete and factual teaching materials were given priority over abstract theoretical models and principles so that students can relate to their laboratory work and so on and so on. Emphasis was given on visual inputs like pictures, diagrams, video clips, so on and so forth, besides asking the students to read some of this literature. Those are uh, published, let's say, uh, various journals and book chapter forms, so on and so forth. Those are relevant only. Now, this induction approach mostly facts and observations were used in order to retain the students' interest on the course contents and to allow them to generalize all these things at a later period so that they can think creatively how best they can take in ethical decisions if they find some ethical dilemma in their engineering work. Then the next one, basically, the emphasis was given on active learning style, such as discussion in small groups, stage presentations. And what we found that whenever you ask a group of students to come to the dais and present their ideas on a case study, they take, they take it very seriously and we could see that there are sparks in their mind and they wanted to share their ideas and thoughts. In that way, they get activated in the class itself. They're, they're very much alert in the classroom. So in the last one, some of the faculty members they adopted both sequential and realized global style as a result students would be able to know what is happening locally as an engineering things. If there's a disaster also, they know. If there's a good things happening in locally also, they know. Also globally, they know that. So it, it, it is up to the profession who is going to deal with that course in a particular Thursday, Tuesday. Now with regard to assessment and evaluation, of course, um, we also take care of the personal, emotional, and professional approach while engaging students in the course content. The reason behind that, remember, it is an afternoon. It is afternoon class after lunch, heavy lunch. So students are sitting in an air conditioner room, 450 students. And we have to take care of all of them and make sure that nobody is sleeping. So therefore, we have to speak to them personally. And of course, emotionally. Emotionally means we'll say in a case study, if something goes wrong, you look at the disasters. How many people will be losing their life? what is going to happen to the environment, so and so forth. Some of the local examples we give them so that they get alert. When you tell that in a particular state it happened or a particular district it happened, so they get alert as if they are participated in that course. So in this way, we deal with the course content, mostly from personal perspective, emotional perspective, and professional perspective. So the approaches were very clear to the students. Now, with regard to assessment, there is a clear assessment that almost all the engineering fac faculty, those are involved in this course and philosophy faculty, we sit together and decide how shall we go about the assessment and evaluation. Of course, we take the student into the confidence. With regard to the assessment, students are divided into small groups. And we ask them to discuss two case studies and mention some of the ethical 
issues pertaining to the engineering profession and how to resolve them by applying the code of ethics. So these are the things that they need to present it in front of every student in the class. And therefore, the group presentation is followed by question and succession in the classroom. So no students can think that I will be part of the group, but I'll not contribute that. Why? Because, because almost all the students are looking at this group, who is presenting what, who has learned what, and what is their views on their case studies. So therefore, students get feedback from their peers as well as class teachers. This is how we take care of the assessment. It is good going so far. Now, with regard to evaluation, how shall we evaluate them and how to grade them? As I told you that this course is a compulsory course. This is a part of an engineering curriculum. So therefore, evaluation plays a very, very vital role. With regard to evaluation, students need to submit a case study pertaining to their own subject. For example, a civil engineering student is going to submit a case study that has relevance to the civil engineering work. So similarly, mechanical engineer, computer science engineer, so on and so forth. Then in addition to that, he or she must discuss the ethical theories find in that case studies. Further, the ethical problems or the dilemma that find in it. In addition to that, how to resolve that ethical problems and dilemma by applying the code of ethics, if at all it is applicable. So therefore, we check the students' creativity in their case studies and mostly their ethical decision-making abilities. And based on that, we give them a mark and score and therefore they get passed. If anybody, whoever is passing the course, we believe that he or she has learned some sort of engineering ethical issues, some sort, at least more than one concept that we believe in. So uh, many people believe that they have learned even 80%, 90% of the content because they themselves participate in that course. So therefore, some sort of engineering ethical issues they learned. And further, we also believe that they can use this, the, the information, what they learned in the course in their future career, if any. Now further, we said in this course, that there is an objective and there is an effort that the objective is to be achieved at the end of the course. And we, all these team members or the course instructor, we put our best effort to make the students to inform that, that whatever appliance they are going to design in their future engineering career or the tools that they are going to innovate are not value neutral. Why? Because any actions that the perform, it has a consequence. If an appliance, it's designed by the engineers and people use it and get benefit out of it. So we say that it is a good appliances. So therefore the, 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 the engineers are directly accountable and responsible for their good innovations. If they have designed an appliance or a tool that have a bad consequence or a tragedy, then they should be ready to take that accountability and responsibility for that design. So therefore we said that engineers as a professionals at the end of the course, they should be ready to take the moral, social, and professional responsibilities while designing the new technology for the benefit of human beings and society at large. So with this, I end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Satya, for uh, making us aware of how ethics is being taught at uh, your institution. And uh, uh, we have time uh, for uh, one question uh, before uh, uh, we say goodbye. I, uh, as I see now, uh, I uh, noted uh, your use of uh, case studies and does this, uh, oh, uh, Glenn, sorry, please. Okay, um, I think it's a, maybe a similar question to what you're asking. Uh, I just had a question of how, of structure, you're teaching a very large lecture uh, with 450 people, but they're still doing small groups. Could you just briefly walk through how big is the small group and how much time do, do they get for their presentation? So usually, so there are few departments are involved in a semester. Let's say civil, mechanical, chemical, ocean engineering, applied mechanics. So in each department, we put them two groups. Let's say each, in each department, we get 40 students around. For an example, or 40, 50, we put them two groups. So therefore, it is easy for them to have case studies. We give 20 minutes. We give 20 minutes to present it and 10 minutes for a discussions. 
So 20 minutes, why? Because in a group, many students, they contribute their ideas. So four or five students from that group, they tell what they have discussed. And if they have left out with any idea, the other group members add to that so that the whole groups make sure that there's nothing left out. Everything they say with the peers as well as the course teacher. So therefore, it is the time for the peers to ask the questions so that they get the feedback. At the end, the course teachers summarizes and gives the feedback so that the whole learning takes place in an, in an active form. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My, uh, my quick question was about the use of case studies that you mentioned, and you put in parentheses um, and you emphasize that you're trying not to focus on uh, disaster cases, which is quite a prevalent approach. And if you could uh, uh, tell a bit about uh, how you move from the micro focus. Uh... See, whenever we give an example, initially in the beginning, we tried by giving many examples from engineering disasters or engineering disaster problems. So we found that students are a little upset. They said that as if all, most of the engineers are involved to do the disaster. So then we said, these are the only examples. Don't get, uh, don't take it personally, rather try to learn from it. So what I wrote in my PPT, that not necessarily the engineering disasters, rather there are good examples that engineers involved to bridge, uh, say to, 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 to design a bridge and this whole work completed before the due time and where we give credit to all the engineers. There are certain cases where engineers involved to attend the objectives of a project. Let's say they told that initially it is five months to take it, but they could able to finish the project in three months with all kind of quality assurance and so on and so on. So these are the projects. It motivates the students to do things much better manner. In, in India, we have a metro system. Few years back, metro was not there. Metro means a small kind of rail where you move from one place to another place so that you don't get into the traffic. And this traffic, the bus, trucks, and other four wheelers can go and metro can go on the top so that people can commute from one end to another end. There is an engineer called Engineer Sridharan. He said that without disturbing the traffic, I can make a plan in such a manner that people can go to the office and come back without you know, waiting in the traffic for a long time. So with this kind of example, if you give to the students, perhaps students get more motivated to do engineering further and further. Of course, some sort of engineering disaster, they need to learn it because in the past, something had happened and because of that, the tragedy happened. From there, they learned that this kind of thing, they're not going to repeat it further because the consequence was not. So in this way, we put the mixture form of good engineering and kind of engineering where there's a tragedy involved so that the blend experience, students uh, gain it in the class. Thank you for explaining. And uh, now as we are um, at the end of the seminar, I want to thank again all four speakers for four very interesting and insightful contribution that give quite a rounded uh, understanding of how ethics can be understood uh, let's say across, uh, across uh, borders and cultures. Uh, I wish uh, everyone uh, happy holidays, whatever uh, the this uh, December period might mean uh, for you and uh, um, your um, commitments and beliefs. And I hope uh, to see you again uh, next year with uh, our forthcoming seminar on sustainability in January. Goodbye. Thank you.